standing. You can stay stay standing. We're going to go to Romans chapter 2. Let me get my mic on. Praise the Lord for Minister Harriet's long passage there that gave us enough time to get the technology working the way it needed to be working. Because the online thing shut down and here we are trying to plug the thing up and get it back working. And I was like, Lord, please let her be long. There's one time you asked the saint to be long with it. And she was actually long with it. Praise the Lord. God is good. What would he do? The Lord already knew the thing was going to shut down, so he let her to read Romans, what's that, Romans chapter 8? Yep. Uh-huh. Hey, I was like, yes, Lord, thank you so much. Okay, and listen, we're going to be in Romans chapter 2. Well, how about that? It all connects together some way, somehow. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the passage, then we'll pray, and then we'll touch on a few things, and then I'll circle back around on this passage today, all right? All right. And, um... We're going to start off in just verse 17. Obviously, we want to keep things in the context. And Paul is dealing with the Jews specifically and the law. So, you know, you know, but the message is still for us today as well as Gentile believers. But he's specifically dealing with the Jews. I um, mean, he says, now, if you call yourself a Jew, obviously, do I have any Jews in here, by the way? I, just, I don't know. <laughs> and the Hebrew is light in here. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law, law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve what is superior because you are instructed by the law, and referring to the law of Moses, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in dark, an instructor of the fools, a teacher of the little children, because you have in the law the embodiment... Uh, embodiment of knowledge and truth you then who teach others do you not teach yourself you who preach against stealing do you steal you who say that people should not commit adultery do you commit adultery you who abhor idols do you rob temples you who boast in the law do you dishonor God by breaking the law as it is written God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. He's dealing with the Jews specifically. This is a hard message here that Paul is giving. And a lot of people don't really like the message that Paul brings because it stomps on the flesh. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirement, Will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a lawbreaker. <laughs> I hope you guys are paying attention to this. And then it says a person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly. Nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit and not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people but from God. Yeah. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we definitely going to need your whole spirit uh, to kind of give us some understanding into what Paul is dealing with as it pertains to the Jews, as it pertains to the law, as it pertains to circumcision, physical circumcision, and how it relates to the title of today's message as it pertains to the underlining work of the Holy Spirit, the circumcision of our hearts. So, Father God, we shall decrease. And, Lord, we pray that you will increase in our heart, that your word will increase, that your understanding regarding your word will increase, and that our practice by your spirit will increase, Father God. My prayer is that we leave out of here better than what we came in. And Lord, the best way to do that is through your word that informs us on all matters pertaining to faith and practice. So Lord, help me to apply this message to your people who are your people. This is your church. This is your word. And Father God, let it convict, encourage, do whatever it is that you sent it to do. Because we know that your word will not return void. So Lord, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. We worship you in spirit and in truth 
Father God, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated in the house of the Lord today. Oh, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. I hope you got your Bibles. I hope you came ready to learn. I hope you got your pen, your pads. Um, I do have from last week and this week, I do have my notes collected. And after we finish our series, I will give that to you all if you want it. It is a long document. I'm already at like 4,000 words. Okay, but that's a combination of last week's message and today's message. And I will continue to build upon this worksheet here to give you all as a guide to help you continue to grow. Because guess what? We're only going to retain 10% of what the pastor say. Okay, so that's what? Uh, 60 minutes I got about, give or take. Okay, 10% of 60 minutes is what? Six minutes. So if you're lucky, you may get six minutes out of my message today. Amen. You may retain the six. The other 54, you're going to forget. It's going to come through one ear and come out the other. <laughs> God is good. But I love you. Let's give God some praise today. Let's give God some praise today. I love the Lord. I don't know what you do. Y'all love the Lord. I love the Lord. I love him with all my heart, soul, and mind. I'm just so thankful to be here. I'm so thankful for this church. I'm so thankful uh, that he's called me during such a time as this. I'm thankful uh, for Brother Anthony's warm sentiments for the opportunity uh, to honor Sister Beverly here at the church yesterday. God is so good and I'm just so thankful for every privilege and blessing that he's bestowed on us uh, and although I am thankful for the opportunity the Lord blesses me uh, what I did yesterday is not going to accomplish the mission for today. As my brother Leo would say all the time, yesterday's home run won't win you today's game. <laughs> and this is so true. What I do yesterday is not going to accomplish the will and the mission that the Lord has for me today. So yesterday, I'm glad, I'm thankful. But after it was over with, then my mind had to readjust to what the message was going to be for today. And today we're going to be dealing with the topic of the underlining work of the Holy Spirit. But the focus is going to be circumcision of the heart. Okay? Are you guys ready to learn today? Because I really believe as every message that we preach at Christian Way Ministry, it's a, an important message. Anytime we deal with God's word, it's important. And it's important because guess what? These are things that are necessary as we continue our own growth and relationship and growth in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the point of highlighting the underlining work of the Spirit is to draw attention to the transforming work he has sent to do in the heart of every believer that doesn't receive the amount of credit it deserves. This is why I classify it as the underlining work because it's not something that we see you know, the process that has to go on when it comes to your individual transformation. So this is the underlining work. When we're talking about the circumcision of the heart, we're also talking about the process, the work of the Holy Spirit that transforms your heart. Yes. Okay. And so last week, I talked a little bit about the way and the why the day of Pentecost had to occur. I explained, I gave you the answer because oftentimes we celebrate the day of Pentecost, but we completely forget why it needed to happen. And why it needed to happen, obviously, is not something that makes us feel good. So, and this is why we don't talk about it often because it's not something that makes us feel good when we talk about the reason why the day of Pentecost had to happen. And there were a few points that I made mention of as to the reason why. One, the problem was that Adam and Eve fell in the beginning of creation. Had it not been because of the fall, the day of Pentecost would have never had to happen. Okay, so that's part of the contribute, uh, that, that's what contributes to why we were celebrating what we celebrated last week. And by the way, our calendar and the Jewish calendar are on two different wavelengths right now. And why is that? Because Israel is in a leap year right now. And when they're in a leap year, they add an additional month to their calendar. And this is why now where we are for the resurrection and Pentecost Sunday is almost a month apart right now. They won't celebrate the festival of weeks for another couple weeks because they're in a leap year. And every, I think in 19 years, 
they have approximately seven leap years. Their system and calendar is complicated. It's like doing gymnastics in your mind, trying to figure out how they came up with such a complex system. So I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty about that. But the reason why we're on two different wavelengths is because we're on two different calendars. Israel is like in year 5784 and we're in 2024. <laughs> OK, they don't have an AD and a BC. It's just one timeline. All right. From the time of Adam and Eve till now. OK, so that's part of the reason why the dead of Pentecost needed to happen was the fall of Adam and Eve. Another reason why is the people of God continue to break the covenant of God and disobey him time and time and time again. Oh well, I know this is these are things as to the reason why the day of Pentecost needed to happen. Man's heart was wicked above all things and possessed a tendency to stray away from God. If we just read the Old Testament, we'll read time and time again, God establishing his covenant with his people, but then we'll read time and time again how they strayed away from the covenant of God, which is the whole reason why God established what? The new covenant. That's the whole reason why. God promised a new covenant that would be established by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is why the day of Pentecost was necessary to fulfill scripture, to fulfill a foreshadow of the festival of weeks that they had to celebrate every year. A harvest festival. And that's why the title of last week's message was called A Spiritual Harvest. Yes, because now we harvest the Holy Spirit to enable us to remain faithful to God's covenant. Yeah. And the other reason why the day of Pentecost had to happen is because part of that new covenant would entail pouring out of the Holy Spirit to enable, to empower, and to equip believers to remain faithful to the new covenant that was established by Jesus' blood. Amen? Amen. So that's, the, that's answering the question, why? Because we need to know the why. And if you don't know the why, then you're going to be celebrating something you don't know why you celebrate it. <laughs> okay, so that's important for us to know moving forward. So when it comes to the question, why the day of Pentecost had to occur, let me again direct your attention specifically to the word of God in Deuteronomy chapter 31. I want to deal with this why just a little bit more here as to the problem that is identified in Deuteronomy. And I find this to me mind blowing. I really do. And Moses is about to die. And Joshua is about to succeed him. And then Moses says here in Deuteronomy chapter 31, this is what the Lord said to Moses in verse 14. Now, I'm going to be reviewing some passages of scripture here that I pray you guys will read for yourself. So then this way you can stay with me and you don't get a, a case of the, the itis, the inflammation of the drowsiness and you fall asleep on me. That's why I want you to go back and forth in your word. Flip with me through the pages so you can stay active, so you can stay engaged. Class is in session. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And it says here in verse 14, the Lord said to Moses, now the day of your death is near. Call Joshua and present yourselves at the tent of meeting where I will commission him. So Moses and Joshua came and presented themselves at the tent of meeting. Then the Lord appeared at the tent in a pillar of cloud, and the cloud stood over at the entrance to the tent. I would have loved to have seen this with my own eyes. And the Lord said to Moses, you are going to rest with your ancestors, and these people will soon, look at this, they will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land they are entering. The promised land, by the way, they will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. This is part of the reason why the day of Pentecost had to happen because the Israelites continued to break the covenant of God. The day of Pentecost would enable us by the power of the Holy Spirit now to keep the new covenant established by the blood of Jesus Christ. And and in that day, I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. Many disasters and calamities will come on them. And in that day, they will ask, have not these disasters come on us because God is not with us? And I will certainly hide my face in that day because all of their wickedness and turning to other gods. Now look what God commands Moses to do. Now write down this song. 
And if you go to chapter 32, there's a song of Moses. Yeah. I challenge everyone to read this song. It's not one of those songs. Praise the Lord. This is the day. This is the day. That the, no, it's not one of those type of songs. It's a song that would remind Israel of God's prophecy to them and how they were going to prostitute themselves to foreign gods. And he establishes this song as a witness and a testimony against what they were going to do when they entered into the new promised land. So this song we see here, again, we bypass it because it doesn't make us feel good. And I get it. It don't make me feel good having to read it. But this is why we have what we have today why we celebrate the day of pentecost because they broke the covenant and this song that was instituted was a song that would testify against their sin and it says that it may be a witness for me against them when i have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey the land i promised on oath to their ancestors and when they eat their full and thrive they will turn to other gods and worship them rejecting me and breaking my covenant and when disasters calamities come on them this song will testify against them because it will not be forgotten by their descendants i know what they are disposed to do even before I bring them into the land, I promised them on oath. So Moses wrote down this song that day and taught it to the Israelites. And I can only imagine as they're learning, you know, the praise and worship team, when they learn a new song and they're trying to learn this song here. Well, Lord, how is that going to sound if we try to sing this song in public? <laughs> I mean, hey, look, maybe y'all can get creative one day and y'all can create a note and a tune for this one song of Moses here outlined in Deuteronomy 32 and then be a witness to the congregation, huh? And we all can clap our hands. What do you think? Good idea? No? I mean, okay, nobody's with me right now. No, Pastor, about that one. I'm just saying it's a song. It's a song. Huh? All right. And after Moses finished writing it in the book of the words in verse 20, uh, 24, uh, from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Take this book of the law and place it beside uh, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. There it will remain as a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stiff necked you are. If you have been rebellious against the Lord while I'm still alive and with you, how much more will you rebel after I die? Wow. Assemble before me all the elders of the tribes and all your officials so that I can speak these words in their hearing and call the heavens and the earth to testify against them. For I know after my death, you are sure to become utterly corrupt. I don't need to read no more. But you guys get a sense of where I'm coming from as to the reason why the day of Pentecost needs to happen because they forsook the, the covenant of God. Amen? So when it comes to the day of Pentecost, we cannot neglect the primary reason why such a day was commissioned by God. There is so much focus on outward expression of the Holy Spirit, but little focus of why such a day was necessary and little focus on the underlining work of the Holy Spirit that leads to our outward expression and that leads to our transformed life in Christ. Amen. I'm, just, I'm just getting warmed up, by the way. I'm just getting warmed up. Last week, I also talked about four main functions of the Holy Spirit, but there are actually seven. I only just made, named four. One, to testify and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, John 15, 26. To remind his disciples everything Jesus said according to the word of God, John 14, 26. To enable his disciples to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ with boldness through the various gifts and signs, even in the most extreme of circumstances. Can't wait to talk about that a little bit more next week. And to convict the hearts of God's people of their sin, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and the judgment that is going to come in John 16, verse 9. Okay, these are the four things I mentioned last week. Now, the other three that I'm going to be tackling this week is to circumcise our hearts. Amen. Underlying work of the Spirit to circumcise our hearts. That's going to be the focus of today's message. And then, this is not too often that this happens, but I'm going to give you what the Lord is going to be leading me to do for the next two weeks. Praise the Lord. Next week, Lord willing, I will focus on the underlining work of the Spirit and how he came to help increase our faith on things not seen. 
things we will not be able to obtain in this life. Can't wait to talk about those things there. Can't wait to talk about those things. And I know some of you are like, well, what are you talking about? Ooh, you got to come back next week. Like a soap opera. You got to come back next week get that message. And then following week, I will speak on another underlining work of the Holy Spirit and how he came to seal the true disciples of Jesus Christ until the day of redemption. Woo. I, I'm so thankful. I'm so happy. I'm so blessed. Because without the seal of the Holy Spirit, guess what? I'm not going to make it into the other side. I need that stamp. I need that seal. I need his spirit. I need the word that's going to carry me to the day of redemption. And this is a work of God so that no man can boast that you got yourself into the kingdom. Because you can't get yourself into the kingdom. That's why you must be born again by the spirit because it's something that you can't do by yourself. That's why it's called grace. That's why it's unmerited. This is why you can't earn it. This is a work of God. Your salvation is a work of God and he's going to seal you to the day of of redemption. That's an underlining word of the spirit that at the end of the day, guess what? We're not even talking about that. And you know what? I apologize that it took me this long to talk about it. <laughs> you know, hey, everything happens according to the time and season in which God wants these things to happen. So God is good. God is good, and I hope that I am a demonstration of my own growth in the word before you all today. And how I'm tackling such a topic like the circumcision of the heart that at the end of the day, the flesh does not want to talk about. Amen. Remember, after Peter preached his first sermon in Acts 2.37, it says what? When the people heard this, they were cut. To the heart. They were pricked to the heart. Now, the word cut or prick is only mentioned, I said this last week, one time in the entire New Testament. And it means to pierce, to prick. Look, I said this, you know, really fast last week, but it also means to pain the mind sharply about something. This is what prick and cutting to the heart means. It means to agitate vehemently and to bring forth the emotion of sorrow. This is what the spirit did on the day of Pentecost. He cut the people to the heart. He pricked them. He agitated them so much in regards to their rejection, their sin, that it led them to repent. Amen. Give it to you later. <laughs> and this cutting and this pricking is one of the major underlining function of the Holy Spirit that does not receive enough attention. And why is that, folks? We have to answer this question. Because it doesn't feel good. That's why. Think about this. Think about this. We don't want to talk about the dirty work the Holy Spirit came to do. Think about it. The work of the cross, how else can you describe it, was ugly. It involved crucifixion, blood, death, humiliation, betrayal. That's what it involved. And this pricking and this cutting that the Holy Spirit came to do inside of our hearts, that's not a pretty process. Oh, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you said that because I'm getting there. Look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, which defies. And he says here in verse 7, he says, you hypocrites. <laughs> I'm not calling you anybody in here hypocrites by any means. You know, but if the spirit of God is coming to your heart, I just pray that you will not like Sister Whitney said, no, not hard in your heart when you hear his voice. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. And I'm not talking about anybody in a Christian way. I'm just, I'm just reading the text. And he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. When I bring it to you, it's not human rules. It's not my own theology. It's not my own opinion. It's not my own perspective. I, grew, I was raised Catholic. I went to Liberty Baptist Seminary. Okay, I was supervised by a Presbyterian chaplain. I served as a youth pastor in the Pentecostal church. And the Lord led me to establish by his grace a church from a non-denominational Christian perspective. So you guys can know that I'm not coming. When have I ever taught Baptist theology here? But most of my education is from a Baptist background. So I'm not up here trying to teach you my theology or my interpretation. No, I'm trying to bring it back to the word of God. Word over everything. Going back to the original intent, the Holy Spirit had intended when he spoke through the authors of scripture during their time. That's what I'm trying to get into. It's not about me at all. It's about the Lord. It's about the word. It's about what the spirit was doing in their life of what he said. And he says here, Jesus called to the crowd and said, listen and understand what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came there and said, ask, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Oh, my goodness. They poor little feelings. They were just so hurt. And sometimes when the pastor get up here and he say what he say, y'all get offended. Y'all get robbed the wrong way. Y'all shut down in the middle of the service. Huh? Because at the end of the day, when it comes to that cutting, when it comes to that pricking, when it comes to when the spirit is operating in here and doing the ugly work that you don't want it to do. Because it goes right against your flesh. Y'all get mad at me? <laughs> I'm just a messenger. <laughs> Amen. Listen, I'm trying to be faithful to the witness of God's word. And I'm trying to preach it boldly, but with gentleness and respect. Because at the end of the day, guess what? Y'all gonna believe what y'all want to believe. There's nothing I can do to change your belief. There's nothing I can do to change your opinion. I'm not trying to. Change your theology. Whatever you want to believe, you're going to believe it anyway, regardless of whatever it is that I say. All I'm here to do is to try to inform a little bit your understanding about certain things as it pertains to God's word. When we're talking about the day of Pentecost, we already know what's common in our culture. The Lord wanted to bring back some things that at the end of the day have lost attention as to the reason why we are where we are. He wants to bring to light the issue about being circumcised from your heart. Mm -hmm. Things that we don't really want to talk about because guess what? It involves that ugly process. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make us feel good. So we would rather not deal with those things that don't make us feel good. Why? Because it's ugly. It's dirty. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And when I think about my own journey, listen, if I can be transparent with y'all, the reason why we don't want to deal with it because we don't want to have to deal with the ugliness that comes with our pride. Yes. We don't want to have to deal with the ugliness that comes with our stubbornness. We don't want to have to deal with the ugliness that comes with our sin. We don't want to have to deal with the ugliness that comes with our addictions and our temptations. When it comes to me, I didn't want to deal with the ugliness that came from my womanizing ways. My sexual immorality. I didn't want to deal with that. Right? Because... The spirit desires things contrary to the flesh. So the reason why we don't talk about the circumcision of the heart is because it involves a lot of the things that's ugly in regards to that transforming process, that cocooning process from going from a caterpillar, getting in that ugly cocoon, and coming out like that butterfly. Some of us are still in that cocooning process, right? I'm just saying, when I think about my own ways, like where the Lord brought me from, who I am today is not who I was 10 years ago. That's right. That's right. That sexual immorality that I'm talking about, yes, I was an adulterer. Yes. I cheated on my wife, and I'm not proud to say that. But the reason why God sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was to clean that ugliness up. Hallelujah. He came to clean that up. Hallelujah. And if I can be transparent and I can be honest with just where I am in my journey, look. Who I am today is because of the work of the Holy Spirit behind closed doors that was washing me up from my sin. Man, I was smoking weed since I was like 13 years old. I thought I was going to be a lifer. The Lord had to clean that up. <laughs> that was
is the ugly work. That's the dirty work. That's the part we don't want to talk about when it comes to the circumcision of your heart. And now going on October 31st, 2024 will be 11 years sober. That's the, that's the ugly work. And I'm not proud of it by any stretch of the imagination. But we cannot lose sight of how the Lord has washed us from the inside out. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Right. And this is what Jesus came. He said, I came to what? To testify to the truth. Amen. Are you ready to handle the truth? <laughs> huh? You're not ready for the truth. Some people don't want to, they want to hear what tickles their spirit. They don't want to hear the truth. This is the hardcore truth. This is the radical truth. This is the truth that shall set you free from what's held you in bondage. And he says, I'm going to send you my spirit so I can clean you up. Because you need a bath. That's why we must be born again. Because I was dirty in my sin. I was dirty in my pride. I was dirty in my sexual immorality. I was dirty in my addictions. And I needed to be clean. I needed more than dove. I needed more than ivory. I needed more than what you call that old spice commercial. I needed more than that. I need God's whole spirit to clean up my dirty heart. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know about you. Maybe y'all hearts are straight washed and clean, and y'all need to be washed by the spirit. But I need it. All of God's spirit to clean me. So why are we not emphasizing the inward process, the underlining work of the spirit? It's because it doesn't feel good. Amen. So what is the Lord pricking your heart today? What has the Lord cut on your heart the past week or so? What has the Lord pricked your heart at the beginning of the year? Have you listened to the voice of the Lord when he pricked your heart? When he pricked your heart? Remember, the cutting of the heart is not something that's going to make you feel good. The cutting of the heart by the Spirit should lead every believer to repentance. That's right. It should move you to confession of yeah. sin. Yeah. And it should move you towards spiritual growth. It should move you to holiness because without holiness, no, no one will enter into the kingdom of God. No. Holiness means to be set apart, yes. to be sanctified, yes. to be pure, yes. to be washed by the Holy Spirit of God from what made you dirty. Yes. God is good. All the time and all the time, God is good. Another important detail about the word cut. Jesus. I think I said that right in the Greek. That's why I only got C's in Hebrew and Greek. Because I'm not that great. But another reason why this word cut is so powerful is that the only time it is mentioned in the New Testament is guess where? On the day of Pentecost. This is the only time this word appears in the entire New Testament and it happens on one of the most important days that we celebrate. The spiritual harvest, the day of Pentecost, the fulfillment of the festival of weeks. And one of the first actions of the Spirit after Peter preached his first sermon was they were cut to the heart. <laughs> Listen, you want to know why I classify and equate the underlining work of the Spirit as a painful, ugly, and dirty process? 
is because of its connotations to the covenant of circumcision. Yes. Oh my okay. goodness. Now listen, I'm about to get a little deep and I'm not using fancy theological words or anything like that, but I'm going to draw the connection for you. In Genesis chapter 17, God makes a covenant with Abraham. <laughs> and this is why we don't want to focus on the covenant of circumcision because we all know what circumcision is. Huh? I, I, I hope I don't have to paint a picture for anybody today. It's an ugly process. It's not something that we like to speak at the pulpit about, but it is a covenant that God established with Abraham, and it involved a physical cutting of the flesh. Jesus. <laughs> Listen, when Abraham when Abraham was 99, 99, 99, nine, that's 9 plus 90, that's 100 minus 1, okay? We'd be blessed for, to make it that old, okay? Listen, this is when he establishes this covenant with Abraham. He says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithless. This is the condition. And be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and you will greatly increase in your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make the nations, you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, the promised land, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you an ever. The land was theirs before they got, before they went to Egypt. <laughs> He's promising them that they were going to come back to the land that Abraham was already dwelling in as a foreigner. And he would come back and establish uh, the, the, the nation there, right? And he says here, near the descent, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant. That's the condition. And you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. It says, the covenant you are to keep, every male among you shall be, what? Circumcised. Well, this is in the Bible. <laughs> Why would they record circumcision in the Bible if it wasn't important for us to really understand the magnitude of the Abrahamic covenant? We're going to get to hear it, why it connects to us in the Old Testament in just a second. It says you are to undergo circumcision, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household, brought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring, whether born in your house or brought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh. Is to be an everlasting covenant. Wow. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now you know. To circumcise, guess what? Also means to cut, to clip. <laughs> it was a physical action performed on every eight day old male child and was implemented to draw attention to the special offspring of Abraham. This physical act of circumcision was pointing to something greater God would do on the day of Pentecost when he would pour out his spirit to circumcise our hearts. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Praise the Lord somebody. I mean, think, do you see that connection here? Oh, I'm, I'm just getting warmed up. Okay? Just as God established the covenant of circumcision to cut the flesh in the Old Testament, Jesus fulfills the part of the Old Covenant by sending the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, on the day the Israelites gather from all nations to celebrate the Festival of Weeks, to cut the hearts of God's people, to convict them of their sin and rejection against Christ, and to circumcise their hearts. Now, Physically, but spiritually. Yeah. All right. Praise the Lord. And so now, let's go to what Paul is saying right here in Romans chapter 2. Amen. Romans chapter 2, he says, circumcision in verse 25 has value if you observe the law. 
But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. Right. So then if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were uncircumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, you who, even though you have the written code of circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision now, this is how Paul correlates it from the covenant of Abraham to the new covenant of Jesus. But circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written coat. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Amen. Amen. And so now, when it comes to this specific passage here, I have seven points that I want to highlight, and we're going to close out. First, there is a problem. It's always a problem. There's always a problem. And the problem is what? Everyone is a lawbreaker. Am I lying? You're right. What does John say? If you say you have not sinned, you a liar. <laughs> you a liar. So everyone is a lawbreaker. That's listen. That is the ugly part. That's the part the flesh don't want to hear. That's the part where I want to close my ears right now. I want to shut down and I want to go about my business. But this is the reason why God sent His Spirit on the day of Pentecost because we all fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. We are innocent, all law. Breakers. Our circumcision of the flesh has no value because of our sinful nature. This is why we need to be circumcised by the Holy Spirit in our heart. Our hearts spiritually need to be cut by God himself, which he does through the Holy Spirit to transform our being and to enable our faithfulness to Jesus Christ and his word. Amen. And like my brother said, like a doctor who performs a heart <laughs> surgery to fix any underlining problem of the heart, the father does open heart surgery through Christ and the Holy Spirit to correct the underlining problem of our unfaithfulness. Isn't that amazing? God had to do open heart surgery on my life in order to get me where I am today. And without that open heart surgery, I'm still dead in my transgressions. This is how important the day of Pentecost is. Because he sent his spirit to transform our hearts. Yes. The one thing that was wicked above all oh, things. Yes. God came to do surgery on you. Yes. Hey, oh. yes. hey, listen, you can go to the doctor right now and they can do all the open heart surgery they want physically, but if you haven't been born again by the spirit, guess what? No matter what the doctor does, you still will be condemned for all of eternity if you have not accepted Christ and you have not been born again by the Spirit. Hallelujah. I don't care what the doctor do. Listen, don't even worry about the open heart surgery. Father God, I need your Holy Spirit right now to transform my heart so I can make it into glory with you. Oh, bump it. That's what it's all about. Bump my healing. I want my spiritual healing more than I want my physical healing. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> look, look what Colossians says. Look what Colossians says. Look, I'm drawing a connection here. Look what Paul says again. This is why a lot of people don't like Paul. I love Paul. His message is <laughs> right on point. Look at this. Colossians 2, verse 9. It says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, which represents the death of Jesus Christ, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. That's a whole sentence, by the way. 
Yes. Not a runoff. <laughs> when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He did that open heart surgery. He forgave us of all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, yeah. not your physical debt or the money you owe on your credit card, but the debt that you owe for your sin, Christ paid for it on the cross by his own blood. He took your ransom, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away. He nailed it to the cross, and he disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. Man, Ooh, I would love to preach on that one day. <laughs> That's a lot there. Listen, so that's one. There's a problem. We all lawbreakers. This is why God sent his spirit. Two, the covenant of circumcision that was established with Abraham was conditional. Okay? They had to perform an action. Circumcision was a sign between God, Abraham, and the nation of Israel. It required faithfulness to that covenant. How do I know? Woo. Had it not been for Zipporah circumcising her own son, and touching Moses' feet with it in Exodus 4.25, God would have wiped out Moses for not being faithful to the covenant. This is something, Lord, would you one day let me preach out of Exodus 4, 4, 25. It says here in verse 24, chapter 4, 24, verse 25. It says, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zephora took a flint knife Cut off her son's foreskin and touch Moses' feet with it. Man, I can't think of a more vivid image <laughs> of this here. This is the listen, it's ugly. That's what I'm saying. It's a dirty process. It doesn't feel good. We're talking about circumcision of the flesh in the private parts. Like this is not, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna do this for me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But this is what it's all about. This is the connection. God came to circumcise the ugly parts of our heart. Yeah. For out of the heart. Amen. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands, who cares about that? Amen. That doesn't defile a person. Nope. What defiles a person is a heart that has not been circumcised by the Spirit of God. Yes. So when it comes to the covenant of Abraham, it required faithfulness. And how do I know? Because in Exodus chapter 4, yeah. Moses was about to get wiped out for not maintaining his faithfulness in the covenant of circumcision. Did he really understand the magnitude of how that was going to translate 2,000 years later? I don't know. I can't answer that question. But here we are drawing the connection today. Number three, circumcision for the Jews was supposed to be physical and spiritual. Not just physical. Verse 28 in Romans chapter 2. It says a person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly. No, is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit. Amen? Remember, God desired this covenant of circumcision to also penetrate to the hearts of God's people in the Old Testament. So Paul is basically just explaining to the Jews then that circumcision was supposed to be physical and spiritual. So now let me draw the connection on why circumcision was not only supposed to be physical, but it was also intended to be spiritual from the Old Testament. Y'all ready? I hope y'all got your Bibles. Leviticus chapter 26. Chapter 26. And I do have this all written down for you. All the verses that you need. You want a copy of this? Because I know only six minutes of this message you will retain. All right? Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40. And it says here, 
But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors, their unfaithfulness and their hostility toward me, which made me hostile toward them so that I sent them into the land of their enemies. Then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. And I will remember the land. Okay, y'all want another verse? Let's go to Deuteronomy when it comes to the circumcision of the heart. This is not just New Testament language. Paul was very familiar with the Old Testament. And this is how he's drawing the connection. Fear the Lord in Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. And it says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm going to give you today for your own good. But to the Lord your God belongs the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants above all nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. There was the command. Deuteronomy chapter 30. As Moses is getting ready to die, right before the Lord... Tells him to write down this song as a witness and testimony to them about their unfaithfulness. Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 6. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you and you take them to heart wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations. And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul. According to everything I commanded you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and will have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you back to the land that belongs to your ancestors and will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. The Lord your God will what? Circumcise your hearts and your hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your life. Amen. So the circumcision obviously did not really take place until the blood of the new covenant was established. So he was pointing them to a time when he was going to circumcise their hearts. Amen. Jeremiah is another passage here when it comes to the circumcision. Jeremiah chapter 4. Isn't this amazing? Well, we would have never thought that there was all of these passages that are referring to the circumcision of the heart in the Old Testament. I mean, what in the world? Yeah. Look, if you Israel, verse 1, chapter 4, then return to me. If you put your detestable idols out of my sight and no longer go astray. And if, and if in a truthful, just, and righteous way you swear, as surely as the Lord lives, then the nation will invoke blessings by him and in him they will boast. This is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and to Jerusalem. Break up your unplowed ground and do not sow among the thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Circumcise your hearts, you people of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, or my wrath will flare up and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. <laughs> one more passage, Jeremiah 9. Now you, got, now you guys see why there's not so much focus on this when it comes to the circumcision of your heart. Because guess what? It doesn't feel good. But it's meant to encourage you in regards to why the day of Pentecost occurred. And prayfully, that when you go home and you get in your secret closet, that part of your prayer would incorporate, Father God, circumcise my heart. Amen? Because I know that that's what I need. Please continue to cleanse me from all unrighteousness and enable me to seek ye first the kingdom and all of your righteousness. Amen. Jeremiah 9, verse 25, 24 through 25, it says, well, you know what? We'll just start at 25. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all who are circumcised only in the flesh. Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm talking about, where circumcision, the covenant of circumcision that God established with Abraham had to be both physical yeah. and spiritual. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that was point number three. Point number four. The written letter of the law or the commandments itself 
cannot circumcise a person's heart. They had the written code. They had the word. They had the covenant. They had the promises. But the circumcision of the heart, the law was unable to do in itself. The Bible in itself cannot circumcise my heart. That requires the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God to come inside of my heart and to literally cut and print and do the sanctifying work that the spirit was sent to do. I know a lot of people today, they say, yeah, I read my word. But there's no fruit of the spirit. Right? So you can read it. But is your heart circumcised? Are you born again by the spirit? That, I know a lot of people, they read that word all day, maybe, whatever. But are you circumcised inside of your heart? Have you been cleansed from all of the ugliness that made up your old self? This is what John the Baptist said in, John, in Matthew chapter 3. This is why John the Baptist said this. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And fire is associated with judgment. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is why Jesus said in the Gospel of John chapter 3, in the very beginning, he says, Barely truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. In a sense, unless their hearts are circumcised by the Holy Spirit. And then, Nicodemus says, well, how can someone be born when they are old? <laughs> Paul, little take tick, right? You got bless Nicodemus. Nicodemus asks, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and to be born. Like, really, Nicodemus, did you just say that? <laughs> but I'm just saying, I mean, I mean, he's an adult, right? He's a Jewish leader. He's responsible for teaching the word. Okay, I probably asked the same question too when I read this for the first time. Like, Lord, how am I gonna, like, how is that? I'm like a whole man, like 180 pounds. Like, how is that gonna, you know? <laughs> but Jesus answered, barely truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born by the water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. Amen. Amen. God is good. All right, so. <laughs> all right, so God knew. His people would need some additional assistance, which is why the day of Pentecost had to occur, which is why God sent power from on high to his disciples, and which is why one of the major underlining functions of the Holy Spirit was to circumcise the hearts of God's people. All right, I'm almost finished here. All right, but let's, let's not forget, physical circumcision under the new covenant of Jesus's blood is no longer a requirement for the people to physically perform okay there was this conversation uh in acts chapter 15 verse 5 through 20 i'm gonna get here in just a minute but the reason why it's no longer applicable for us today is because physical circumcision alone cannot save you circumcision remember was only implemented during the time of abraham as a sign of god's covenant and promise to him that his offspring would be as numerous as the stars and once Jesus Christ came to establish his new covenant, anyone who would place their faith in Christ becomes part of Abraham's seed, which thus fulfills the promise of the Abrahamic covenant that his seed would be as numerous as the stars. And only the Lord knows at this point how many people have come to save in faith since the time of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the amazing part of how God fulfills this covenant. And I'm not sure if we truly understand the magnitude of what I just said. So when it comes to physical circumcision, it's no longer required. Acts chapter 5, they had this discussion at the Council of Jerusalem, the first council pretty much of the church. 
And it says in verse 5, it says, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised. They're required to keep the law of Moses. That was a conversation in the first century that the Gentiles who will flock into the faith, they must now undergo the physical requirement of circumcision. <laughs> then the apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed brothers. You know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. Wow. No, we believe it's through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. Mm. Then guess what? The whole assembly became silent. Mm. Like sometimes when you can hear a pin drop right here, Christian way, mm. as they listen to Barnabas. Amen. As they listen to Barnabas. We have a, do we have a Barnabas in the house yeah. today? Yeah. I did not see his face today. Where is Barnabas? Oh, his daddy? His, oh. <laughs> Barnabas, we were talking about you today, but you won't hear witnesses. Listen, it says Barnabas and Paul telling about, and I just pray for the life of Barnabas, that he will be bold in the proclamation of this gospel that we're preaching today. That's my prayer for Barnabas. But I can't wait for Barnabas to get older, but I'm going to give him some word. Barnabas, when you were small, you was an infant. Yes, sir, I was preaching about you. Huh? Your name in the Bible, buddy, and here is what Barnabas did in the scriptures. Yeah, he was preaching that word. Uh, so it says here, Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles to them. When they finished, James spoke up. He, the leader of the Jerusalem church spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us God first intervened to chose the people for his name from the Gentiles. The prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. They went back to the word and they investigated this and they said, hey, let's go back to the scriptures and see what the scriptures has to say. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things from long ago. It is my judgment that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest time, and it's read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So when it came to the Council of Jerusalem, physical circumcision was not part of that discussion. They did not have to abide by physical circumcision because what's important now is the circumcision of the heart. Whew, praise the Lord. Wow. Last two points. The good news is that although the covenant established throughout scripture was first given to the nation of Israel, the new covenant has been extended to all of God's people. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. That me, as a Gentile from the island of Puerto Rico, Bayamón, Amen, Rio Grande, yes, Sabana Seca, and the list goes on. We stayed in a couple parts of Puerto Rico, by the way. Huh? Even someone like me can now come to the saving faith, and God will pour out his spirit to circumcise my heart, that no matter where you find yourself in life, you can be in Antarctica. You can be in Greenland. You can be in Bermuda. The Spirit was poured out on all people to circumcise their hearts, those who confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised them from the dead. Amen. Galatians chapter 23, verse 29 says, Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now this faith has come. We are no longer under a guardian. 
So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor there is a male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are what? Abraham sees and hears according to the promise. That's what it is. That's the new covenant. It's extended to all nations. Praise the Lord. So this is what the day of Pentecost truly represents, that extension of God's covenant to all of God's people. And now we're considered part of Abraham's seed by faith, not by physical circumcision. Yeah. <laughs> and last but not least, here we go. Circumcision minus faithfulness to the word of God has no value. It means it's no circumcision at all. If you are not faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, there's a pretty good indication that you're not circumcised in your heart. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we talk about in our culture much, <laughs> is way more than your outward expression. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I love you guys. And I'm not trying to hear to change your theology or anything like that, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is much more than what you're doing up front. Listen, just as the covenant of circumcision for the Jews was supposed to be both physical and spiritual, the baptism of the Holy Spirit should encompass both inward transformation and outward fruit. I'm afraid we're trying to, uh, to carry the cart before the donkey. We're more focused on outward expression versus the only process that needs to take place to wash your wicked heart. I'm only here to preach the truth that y'all set you free, folks. I'm not here just to emphasize one thing. I'm here to emphasize the whole counsel of God. All 66 books. That's what I'm here to bring to light. And this is part of that discussion. Circumcision of the heart. Inward transformation. Yeah. Sanctification. Holiness. Yeah. That underlining work of the Holy Spirit. That needs to take place for you to be born again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You can walk around saying you love God. Mm -hmm. You can walk around telling me what gifts you got. But if your heart is not circumcised by the Spirit of God, what you do essentially has no value. You know what it is? It's hypocrisy. That's why Jesus says Isaiah was right. <laughs> you worship me by your lips, but your hearts are far removed from me. You got this outward expression that's inconsistent with your inward fruit. Man, God does not judge by outward appearance. He judges man's heart. So if we go emphasize anything at Christian Way Ministry, we must emphasize the one thing that Christ sent his spirit to transform. <laughs> That's your heart, folks. Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we need you to circumcise our hearts for you. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all of our heart and soul and mind. Those things of our existence that are inward. This is what we are to do to love you with. And Father, if you don't circumcise us by your spirit, we will be unable to fulfill the greatest commandment. And we can't really do anything else consistently according to your word if you don't wash us inside out. So, Father God, that is my prayer at Christian Way. 
No matter how far we may be in our journey, in our relationship, the Bible tells us that we must deny ourselves and pick up our cross daily and follow you. So, Father God, that's my prayer, that as we follow you, you will continue to do the convicting, sanctifying, purifying, the underlining work of the Holy Spirit that will continue to transform our hearts. Yes. Father God, we all need improvement to some degree. And the question I asked earlier, I posed again, what is the Spirit pricking the hearts of your people today? Father God, prick us. Cut us, Father God. Clip us, Father. Speak to us, Father. Discipline us, Father. Do the dirty work that's required to transform our life. Father, you are such a gracious God that you would even put in this type of work to send your son Jesus to die on the cross and then to send the Spirit to do this work in our hearts. To save us for all of eternity. Like we are not deserving of these spiritual blessings. But you did it anyway. God, you are so faithful even when we're faithless. Yes, so Father, I thank you for this word. And yes, it may not have been a feeling good message. But Lord, this is so important that we are circumcised in our hearts. The reason why I'm here today is because of how you continue to circumcise my heart. And Lord, it's all about our heart posture. And Father, I pray that you will realign our heart back to your word. That you will continue to lead us and guide us into all truth. The truth that Jesus came to testify, he came to die for. This is what's going to set us free. Have your way in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you all today.